This is a beautiful piece of 20th century modernist music by Elizabeth Lutyens. And so is this. And they are vastly different. You didn't notice? OK, we'll try this. A cultural gulf exists between this, by Benjamin Frankel, and this, also by Benjamin Frankel. Nope, we're not talking about atonal music versus tonality. Lutyens and Frankel were both great modernist composers of the later 20th century. No, we're talking about how this music was used and what it was written for. Because this... is a concert piece called Quincunx, and this is the score for horror film The Skull. And this... is Benjamin Frankel's Second Symphony, and this is Benjamin Frankel's score for Hammer Studios' Curse of the Werewolf. I'm Neil Brand, and it's my own experience as a film composer which has led to my fascination with the many great avant-garde composers of the 20th century who were prolific in scoring horror, as well as advancing musical experimentation in the concert hall. To find out more, we have to enter the creative melting pot that gave birth to these bizarre musical mashups. A large, dark house with a grim reputation. If you happen to be lucky enough to float past this building from the River Thames, what you'll see is a very large, very imposing, what looks like half and half, a country house and a castle. I'm taking my life in my hands and entering the Hammer House of Horror at Bray Studios. So we're looking at the portico at the front of the house. We've got Bray Film Studios written across it. It's looking out onto the river. I've seen a lot of Hammer Horror. I think I've seen a lot of famous people going through those doors and up into that portico. Can you tell me a little bit about what scenes we might recognise the house from? The one that all Hammer fans will remember for using that portico was in The Mummy in 1959. You see Christopher Lee and his bandages loom up to that portico, breaks through the windows to attack Peter Cushing inside. Of course, Peter Cushing isn't inside. He's on stage one <laughs> on the lot where they've built the inside of the room. Hammer aficionado Wayne Kinsey at Bray Studios in Berkshire. Bursting from its dark and blood-stained walls are ghosts, monsters, and an army of the undead marching to the unearthly music of later master of the Queen's music, Malcolm Williamson. of Malcolm Williamson's score to the 1960 Hammer film The Brides of Dracula. We'll also encounter terrified maidens subjected to the lustful embrace of lesbian vampires. It was the most enormous fun. It was about sexing up the films, it was trying to get audiences in. Ingrid Pitt obviously drooling and having a wonderful time. I was <laughs> relatively fresh from convent school. I didn't know what a lesbian was. But that was also what they were after in the film. Yes, I it? know, and that's why I had such a gormless face, and that's what they wanted. <laughs> there was music playing on set. I think that was probably there for atmosphere. It was rather eerie, and it actually made the scene. Actress Madeline Smith, star of 1970 Hammer film The Vampire Lovers, scored by Harry Robertson. It was the Hammer House of Horror that gave worthwhile employment to these titans of British modernism, and they were not only glad of the money, they fundamentally changed film scoring in the process. 
It delights me that there would have been very few cinema goers of the 1960s and 70s who would have realised that they were listening to the cutting edge of classical music as the blood flowed and the victims died. Here's author and historian David Huckvale. How far did audiences notice? They didn't. <laughs> I don't think audiences noticed it at all. I, they certainly wouldn't have noticed it was a serial yeah. film score. But the interesting thing is, they were listening to this advanced music in the context of a film, and it was perfectly OK. Whereas you put them in a concert hall with a lot of chaps wearing black pearl and neck sweaters and smoking cigarettes and being terribly intellectual, they'd run a mile. So it was an interface between the avant-garde and populism. So how did these bipolar edges of British culture come to meet? Well, there's one name in particular that can take responsibility for that. One of Hammer's little-known backroom boys, the studio's music supervisor, Philip Martell. He was responsible for hiring a whole roster of British modernist composers, including Malcolm Williamson, Richard Rodney Bennett and Elizabeth Lutyens. Here's David Huckvale again. Would it have come as a surprise to Liz Lutyens to be invited to write for Hammer? Or was there something that Phil Martell would have heard in her music that he thought, I think this is exactly what we need? Well, first of all, she needed the money, so she was very happy to do it because and she did radio scores and all sorts of things. So the money was a keen thing. It was just work. So... Philip Martin was very open-minded. He wanted to get as many leading composers working for him. And um, Hammer were very open to the fact that without this music, the film simply wouldn't work. You'd get commissioned, and then you would be shown the film. And Phil would ask you for ideas. Do you have any ideas? And um, he did say to me once, David Whitaker. I phoned him up and I said to his wife, oh, I've got a job for David. Would he like it? And she said, oh, he hasn't had any work for ages. And I said to David when he saw the film, what do you have? Any ideas? And David said, no. So I said, well, get out of here, David. So, I mean, you had to come up with something <laughs> quickly. And um, you get about two, three weeks, which is astounding. You've got to write the equivalent of a sort of short opera in three weeks. So that's why you have often the greatest names you can get. So I'm looking at these fantastic scores, original scores from the Hammer Horrors. We've got Elizabeth Lutyens. She was very bad at timing. She admitted her maths wasn't up right. to much. And she used to have very complicated time signatures, something like, you know, 17, 8, yes. followed by yeah. 5, 6 or something, you know, yeah. something like yeah. that. Well, I'm right in front of the timing problem here because it's, it's fascinating. Phil Martel was conducting to a section of the film on screen. Probably would he have had streamers going across yeah. giving him yeah. timings? So the timing has changed across... One, two, three, four, five, six bars. At the, the top of the bar is a number scrubbed out, then another number, which obviously was... The, so that's how I've got to take that one to hit that point. Mm. Then it's scrubbed out again. Mm, mm. So actually what you've got is, I suspect these are the live notes that Phil Martel was writing in as he tried to beat the time to actually hit in the right place. Got it wrong, scrub it out, go Could again. Well and with loads of cues to the film, uh, she stops, watches dead men, moves chair closer. Now, those two cues are within four bars. Of yeah, oh, yeah. So it's very tight. Known somewhat dismissively as 12-tone Lizzie, a reference to serialism, which I'll explain in a moment, Elizabeth Lutyens was a pragmatist who poured her life and soul into her music and didn't mince her words. Every film I do, I take seriously. I'm on its premise during the time I'm writing it and suspend criticism because all my job and what I've been paid for and I'm old-fashioned enough to think the client is always right, is to do my contribution to make this film what it is with knobs on. Lutyens was so happy in her position as horror composer to the nation 
she encouraged her students to follow suit, including a young Richard Rodney Bennett, who went on to score Hammer's The Nanny and The Witches before making it big with classics like Murder on the Orient Express and Four Weddings and a Funeral. I had no interest in the traditional language of film music, if you like, that mishmash of Rachmaninoff and so on. But just as design changed a lot in films in the 50s, so too did the film music. I realised that this was an area where I could work. One of the very early times that I noticed film music in a movie called The Bad Seed, which is still a pretty good thriller. It's about a child murderess, and it's a lovely sunny morning, and there's this little moppet going off to school, and the music is saying there's something terribly wrong. <laughs> and I remember thinking when I saw that, that's what film music can do. Mm. It wasn't going bang and, you know, doing terrifying noises. There was a terrible sense of unease in the music, which wasn't there actually on the screen. And that's the best thing film music can do. I was heavily influenced by Elizabeth Lutyens, an absolutely electric woman and a very inspiring person for the young. And I used to come up from school at half term and spend the day with Liz. She never gave me any film work because, you know, she, she was in desperate need of money herself. But she taught me a lot about things like notation and how to deal with, a, with cue sheets for a film. She had a very healthy attitude to film music, which I think I've always had which was that it's a high class of journalism. I've never thought of my film music as being important in any way. Uh I don't even really like it being taken out of context. Richard Rodney Bennett, from an interview I made with him in the late 1990s. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why was modernism the perfect sound to induce unease? Well, as listeners to music, we have a kind of secure place, a happy place. It's the place where we know that the tonality is not going to surprise us. All perfectly predictable. But then when a tune does this... We're left with a question mark. We are suddenly off what we expect the music to do. And it actually has an effect on us organically. If you imagine walking away from a cottage in the woods and going deeper and deeper and deeper, but through the trees you can still see the cottage... Your way home is obvious, but as you go further into the woods and you start to lose sight of the cottage and your first thought is how on earth are we going to get back to where I thought we were? That is the basis on which music puts us out of our comfort zone. And it helps if you begin to lose not just the cottage in our metaphor, but the home key. Modernism took that tonality, and in a way, our kind of security about that tonality, and ditched it entirely. There are 12 notes in the scale. That is our normal tonality. Why don't you mix up those 12 notes? And they could be, say... That is a serial tone row. And if you make that the basis for all of your harmonic progressions, all of your tunes, you never have a home key. That was the point of modernism. What that means is that when it came to watching a horror film, if the music was also doing... the overall feeling is of continuous unease. Add to that suspense. And suspense, as Hitchcock said, is not about the firing of a gun, it's waiting for that shot. And this is suspense. And here we sit, and we wait to know where we're going next. 
and we still don't know. And we are held in its grip. People who score films know that the whole point of a piece of music is to hold the audience to the picture by not resolving, by holding that tension for longer and longer until it's like a rubber band being stretched to the point where it could break. And if you have a modernist writing your horror film, when it does break, the big climax is massive. The concert hall composers who worked for Hammer were given a brief, they knew how much music was needed and they were given enough time to write it. But beyond that, how far were they allowed to experiment? Here's David Huckvale again. The great success of Hammer was its ability to let people get on with things. Harry Robinson came into the film business through pop music. He was involved with Lord Rockingham, Hoots Mom, that famous hit. But he was an absolutely superb orchestral composer, I think. He admitted that he stole things. And he said, you know, I'm not the only one. Puccini stole liberally and made no bones about it. And he said, I steal. And uh, if you listen to Twins of Evil with Harry's music, there's loads of Sibelius. It's Sibelius's fourth symphony, almost lifted. <laughs> But he also was a very interesting innovator in many ways. He used all sorts of odd percussion effects on Countess Dracula. Tuned sleigh bells, a vibraphone with a violin bow. You bow the vibraphone to create this really eerie sound. In Twins of Evil, where you have a lot of vampire hunters led by Peter Cushing on horseback, he thought, this is my opportunity for a Western. So he writes this big Western theme, but with chromatic elements in it. It's sort of the good, the bad, and the ugly gothic style. Harry Robinson's music for Hammer's Twins of Evil. But what about the other side of the camera? How much were the vampire's victims aware of what their fates would sound like? Scream Queen of the Vampire Lovers and Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell, and still gorgeous some half-century later, Madeline Smith. To watch, for example, Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell and to imagine it without this phenomenal music, it would be dead we would all be floating around that rather odd set and it would be like going to a very bad Shakespearean play. And I've seen quite a few of those and probably appeared in one or two. Um, what do you think the very, music fills in that's not already there? Atmosphere. Music is extraordinary at conjuring emotion. It can produce fear, terror, where there really isn't any inner scene. Peter Cushing can pull a face, and he does pull a lot of faces, I have to say. But, you know, the music will tell you what's going on inside his head. Ingrid Hiss was quite a girl. Mm. Didn't like her fangs, lots of screaming, very interested in bearing everything all the time. It was very wildly eccentric, very hot-blooded lady. 
one of your naughty secrets with Ingrid, where she's chasing you around the bedroom. The music for that is this very high, very innocent two flutes. Yes, I doing dubba 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 I dubba. remember that. It does come to me when you tell me that. Yeah. I, and I'll it be... takes any sense of threat or naughtiness yes. out of it completely. Madeline Smith and Harry Robertson's score to The Vampire Lovers. Well, we've heard the sound of Hammer Horror and met some of its cast, so it's time to tour the house itself. Bray Studios in Berkshire, where the imposing mansion that was Hammer's home in the 1950s and 60s still stands today. I met up there with Hammer aficionado and author Wayne Kinsey. Wayne, we're standing in the grounds of the original film studios. We're looking at the house. Tell us how Hammer used to use this space. They first moved in in 51, and at that time they shot the films inside the rooms and on the ground. So you'll see little bits of the outside of the property in quite a few of the films. Mm -hmm. In their first Frankenstein film, Curse of Frankenstein, you see the mummy loom up to the portico facing the Thames. That was problematic for them, though, because they were just rooms. They weren't stages, so they weren't soundproofed. And where we're standing now, literally, we're on the banks of the Thames. Yeah. So they'd be filming in a room and they'd have to stop as a boat went past. We're very close to Heathrow, all the airplanes coming past. Uh, it was an offence to flush the toilet at that time. And if you listen now... There's a plane. That's what, <laughs> that was the problem Hammer were facing when they were first filming here. One thing you do notice if you see a lot of hammers is that a lot of the sets come back from one film to the next. <laughs> I assume that's a, one of the other good things about this method of filmmaking is that they could leave a set up if it came. Absolutely, because if you went to Pinewood or Elstree, you would rent a stage. At the end of shooting, you would have to take all the sets down because another film was going to go onto that stage. Here, it was their studio. They could put a set up on a stage, leave it there for the next production. You'd see that in the cinema six months later. And I'll give you one good example. At the end of uh, their first Dracula, you've got that fantastic scene where it's in the library, Peter Cushing jumps onto a refractory table, runs, pulls the curtains down, bays Christopher Lee in sunlight and dissolves him. Well, two weeks later, they're filming on that same library set, unchanged, and it's now the boardroom of the hospital in The Revenge of Frankenstein, their first Frankenstein sequel. The thing I've noticed about Hammer particularly is that they're always watching the pennies. It was a family, the family atmosphere, and that's what allowed them to really work as a well-oiled machine and just punch these films out so quickly for small budgets. And when you watch them on the screen, they look like they made for a million dollars, but mm. the budgets were incredibly tight at the time. Wayne Kinsey. It's comforting to realise that the dark fables that so terrified 50s and 60s audiences were made with such care on such tiny budgets. The difference between the lush fantasies on screen and the harsh realities of filming at Bray are typical of most British film productions of the time. Now, as we've heard, Hammer composers such as Elizabeth Lutyens and Benjamin Frankel didn't look down on their horror work, not least because it brought in money at a time when commissions were slow in coming and allowed them to ply the trade they loved. But these modernist composers found that their brush with horror often had unforeseen consequences. These composers were writing concert music at the same time as they were doing film music, whereas now people sort of specialise in one or the other. Was there any kind of pushback from the concert world to yes. the composers who'd gone to film? There was, because you're tainted. And that did happen to Ben Frankel. He was sort of tainted by the popularity of the films. There was a lot of snobbery around, yeah, I'm afraid, and um, it did affect them. David Hutvale. There's one important name we haven't yet mentioned, a composer who is now synonymous with Hammer Horror, being responsible for Dracula's introductory hammer blows. See what I did there? James Bernard was not a modernist concert hall composer in the same category as Lutyens and Frankel, but he did come from a great modernist pedigree. Here's Hammer authority, Wayne Kinsey again. James Bernard was the sound of Hammer Horror. He used to take the name of the film title and use that for his main themes. Classic Dracula, Dracula. You 
watch film after film and you will see the title stamped out in the main theme. James Bernard was a protégé of Benjamin Britten. He went over to live with him in Alborough to copy out the voice score for Billy Budd that Britten was just writing at that time. Britten knew there was something in James Bernard and he sent him away. Go find your own career because you're destined for greatness. So what ultimately was the effect on film and film music of these monsters of the avant-garde invading the charnel house? David Huckvale. The whole avant-garde movement was trying to liberate dissonance. What these composers did when they brought dissonance in was to sort of reinforce its romantic connotation of, of unease and horror. I mean, this is all popular romanticism, isn't it, really? So, in a way, they were undermining the whole movement of the avant-garde with its own weapons. And I think subsequently it's been demonstrated that the avant-garde in a way kind of failed. It didn't achieve its mission in liberating all this distance. So there you have it. As always, music in film simultaneously creates worlds and goes unnoticed. But the music of Hammer horror films was crucial in filling in gaps left by shoestring budgets. It placed us in worlds that couldn't exist, and yet somehow seemed to exist enough to terrify us all. Our real lives became infected with the virus of fear, and the long walk home in the dark, or the sound of tree branches brushing a window, was suddenly full of dread. Hammer horror films changed the world of horror forever, but it was arguably thanks to modernist classical composers that the monsters really walked amongst us. Mm -hmm.